Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. God is good how often? And all the time. Look over at somebody. Don't get too close. Say neighbor. God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me. As much as I love you. Then nothing can break. I love in two. Amen. Certainly it is just once more and again that the great God of heaven has decided to smile upon us on this morning. And it's so good to know that when we woke up this morning, that God was not just on our mind, but we were on God's mind when we woke up this morning. And just to sit back and think, man, who am I that God would even think about little old me? Where I've been, what I've done, what I've been involved with, and yet and still God decides to think about me. New mercies we see every morning. Great is the Lord's faithfulness. He is so good to us. We don't deserve nothing from God. We haven't earned anything from God. I know some of us think we all there in the bag of chips. I know, I know, I know we, are, I know we think we're there. But let me tell you, none of us are to the point that we are so good that God just got to do anything for us. Because the Bible lets us know that all of our goodness in the eyesight of God ain't nothing but filthy rags. That's why Paul said that it's not of good works, least any man should boast. It's not by anything that you've done. It's all because of the grace and the mercy of God. You may it this far in your life off of the grace and the mercy of God and guess what if you want to make it even further you're going to make it by the grace and the mercy of God you can't make it by grace alone you can't make it by mercy alone you got to have both of them. you got somebody say I need a package deal you got to have grace and you got to have mercy if you expect to make it in my house I need grace and mercy on my job I need grace and mercy in my marriage I need grace and mercy in my relationship I need grace and mercy Your grace and your mercy shall follow me All the days of my life No matter where I go I got two little men walking behind me Called grace and mercy You may see me and think I ain't got nobody on my side But I got grace and I got mercy You might have thought you had knocked me out And I was down for the count But good God I'm out of here come grace Here come grace And mercy and it's not just going to follow me until I make a mistake. It's not just going to follow me until, oh man, I'm all in the newspaper, all over this. They talk. It's not going to follow me until then. It's going to follow me all the days of my life. So, so you mean to tell me God's grace and mercy? follows those that don't love him yeah the bible says that god causes rain to fall on the just as well as the unjust so don't you look at nobody and say what they don't deserve and how they don't need this and how they don't need that look in the mirror you'll soon find out you don't deserve it either it's all because of grace we go home now we go home now because we realize that we are never by ourselves. God has never left us alone. But you got grace and you got mercy. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. Good morning, good morning. We're just so thankful for everyone that is here on this morning. For those that are watching us via live stream, we're thankful that you stopped by to tune in here with us on this morning. We just want to let you know that you are just as part of this this morning as we are. And we want you to do something for us as I ask weekly. I want you to invite somebody to church. Go ahead and take a moment. Not going to take you long. Just go ahead and hit share. Start a watch party. Whatever you're going to do, go ahead and do that at this time. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, Lord, and hear my humble cry. Lord, and while on others thou art calling, Master and do not pass me by, and we're calling you, say, Oh, sweet say, Savior, why? 
why don't you hear my my humble cry? Lord, and why on the side are calling Master and do not pass me by. Amen, amen. Man, 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 I, I kind of just want to go off on grace and mercy this morning, but I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay, this is when we're, um, we're in week eight. We're in week eight um, this morning of this series of lessons that we've been doing um, entitled Abraham, a man that walked by faith. Um, so we've been with Abraham all throughout his journey. We met him um, when God first came to him and visited him at his father's house out in Ur of the Chaldees. And God gave him a mission. God told him, hey, I want you to leave everything behind. Get up and go to, hey, I got something that I want you to do. I want you to follow me. Follow my word. We've been with Abraham as he went. Did he go up or down in the Egypt? Went, yeah, went down in the Egypt, you know, and, and we learned a lesson from that, that anytime you veer away, you get off of the path of God, you always find yourself going down, never uphill battle. And then when he left out of Egypt, now going towards the promised land, we see him coming out of there and now he's on an upward plane. He's had a little family trouble. He had a little trouble with his nephew Lot. Um, their herdsmen started bickering with each other and now they've separated. They've gone their separate ways and now here we are. God has revisited with Abraham. He's talked with him. He's gone back over the promise that he had made to him and let him know, hey, the promise that I made to you has not died. The promise that I have made to you is not null and void. The promise that I made to you is still going to come to pass. So that's where we find ourselves this morning. Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. The grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away. But the word of God shall stand forever. That was an old cowboy preacher um, that had trained his horse. Um, and every time he would get on that horse, if he wanted the horse to go, he'd say praise the Lord. If he wanted that horse to stop, he'd say amen. So one day he was out on his horse and he was, I mean, he was making a ride, just get it, boy. And, and when he wanted to take a little lunch break by the mountain, he uh, said amen. And the horse stopped, you know, he took his lunch and he got back on the horse and he was riding. And man, the horse was coming up on a little cliff. And the man, before you know, he said, whoa, whoa. Notice that the horse wasn't stopping. Then he remembered he had to say amen. And he said, amen, right as the horse was about to go off the cliff. And he leaned back and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Genesis chapter 15. <laughs> Verses 1 through 6. I can tell you that didn't end well. That didn't end well. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. You got, you, if you're there, say I'm there. Yeah. All right, the Bible says... After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. I want to give simply for our message this morning, a word from the Lord. A word from the Lord. Somebody say, I need a word from the Lord. Years ago, a man by the Dr. Seuss, y'all remember Dr. Seuss, don't you? Um, years ago, Dr. Seuss, he wrote a book and it was entitled, Horton Hears a Who. Y'all remember that? Horton Hears a Who. This book is about an elephant named Horton who hears voices coming from little specks of dust. This story relates how Horton placed a speck of dust 
on a clover bloom and did his best to protect the tiny residents inside that speck of dust from the other animals who could not hear the voices rising from the dust particles. And as the story develops, Horton learns that the race living inside the speck of dust were what they called the Who's. They lived in a town called Whoville and needed a protector to pre prevent them from being blown about by the wind and being destroyed by other means. Of course, the other animals in the jungle did not believe Horton and they gave him a hard time about his belief that a tiny race inhabits a particle of dust. They tried to destroy the speck of dust and they even tried to tie Horton up. Eventually, all the Who's in Whoville joined their voices and they shout in unison so that they might be heard by the animals who have tormented Horton about his strange beliefs. They are finally heard when the tiniest Who of them all, a tiny yo-yo throwing type by the name of Jojo, lifts his voice up and says, yup. To make a long story short, there are two great moral lessons taught by Horton Hears a Who. The first is that you should be kind to all people, even when others refuse to be kind to them. And the second is that even the smallest of the small is an important person in the eyesight of God. You may wonder what that has to do with preaching. What that got to do with Abel? Well, you finna find out. The answer lies in the fact that Horton heard a voice one day that changed his life forever. In our text, Abram hears a word from the Lord. And this word from the Lord, it changed his life. In Abram's day, he was just one insignificant person amongst millions of other people. But God had a special plan for this man's life. And to God, Abram was a su of supreme importance in his plan. In the passage that we read, Abram receives a word from the Lord concerning his fear, concerning his future and concerning his faith. I said he received a word from the Lord concerning his fear, concerning his future and concerning his faith. Now what he heard changed his life forever and he received a word from the Lord and it changed his path. And by the way, all of the possessions that we have in this world, none can compare to the word of God. I, I don't care. None of the possessions that we have in this world can compare to the word of God. To be able to hold in our hands the complete and perfect revelation of God to man is a treasure that does not have an equal. In this passage, God had a word for Abram, but he also had a word for you and me this morning. Let's listen in on this conversation between the Lord and Abram and let's see how it can help us in our life. Now, Abram has just returned from a great military victory. And during the course of the campaign, he met a bitter enemy by the name of King Chedorlaomer. And this king was mighty enough to come against Sodom and the cities of the plain. And surely Abram felt that he was in danger of attack from this king that was coming out of the east. And God has a word of comfort to, uh, uh, to assist him with the fear that he has going on. And isn't it good to know that when we find ourselves battling some kind of crazy situations in life, that we can always find comfort in the word of God, that we can always find some kind of peace in the word of God, but you got to open it up if you expect to find it. Am I right about it? Now, now the peace that comes from knowing God. Now, th this is the first time the phrase fear not is ever used in the Bible. First time you'll ever see the words fear not used together in the Bible, but thank God it will not be the last. Men may encourage us to walk in peace and fear not, but their words are empty and without power. It's good for me to tell you, oh, fear not, keep on, keep going, and it's good, and you'll listen to me. But, but, but it's a different thing when you hear it from the word of God. Now, now I got some assurance. If God said it, I can count on it because God will do exactly what he said. Now, however, when the Lord comes by and speaks peace to our heart, Fear got to leave out. Fear and faith cannot abide together. I cannot say I'm a person of faith and be a person of fear at the same time. Because whenever fear is in the room and faith shows up, fear got to leave. Because, fit, because faith trumps fear. Now, the disciples in the ship, 
He let them know that he was still the great I am. And that great I am was able to calm the storm that they were going through. And isn't it good to know that when we find ourselves going through storms, going through trials, and going through tests, that we don't have to wonder where help is coming from, but we know where our help is coming from. David, when David was going through trouble, David said, man, I looked in the north, there was war and trouble up there in the north. Looked in the south, war and trouble down in the south. East and west, there's war and trouble in the east and the west. David said, man, instead of me looking to the north, the south, the east, or the west, I decided to lift my eyes up unto the hill from whence they come my help. All of my help comes from the Lord. Abram needed not fear the attacks of his enemies. The Lord was kept about him. And all he had providing protection both day and night. Now, note this. Those who are the Lord's are sheltered by him at all times. I, I, I said, those that are the Lord's, those that claim Christ and Christ claims you, you are protected, not just at some times, but you are protected at all times. On every side, round about, the devil might think, think he's going to catch you slipping. You're not paying attention, not knowing that God has built a hedge of protection around you. And I'm so glad, man, I can face tomorrow with assurance. I can go out in this world and I can hold my head up high. I'm not worried about what the devil is trying to do, what he's trying to set up because God has already assured me that he has built a head of protect. He's not just in front of me because the devil will come up behind me. He's not just behind me because the devil will try to come up in front of me but whatever side you come you got a God that's standing there and he's guarding and protecting you round about. Abram is a man who has left home and family to follow God. But as of yet, he has not yet received even the slightest bit of what God had promised him. He is also a man who gave up much when he refused to offer the offer of the king of Sodom. Y'all remember we talked about that on last week and how the king of Sodom told him, say, hey man, you, you can have it all. You know, you go ahead and take it all, but we know that Abram realized, hey man, that's not mine. That belongs to God. And that dealt with the integrity of Abraham. And he is also, as we say, he gave up all of that. And now the Lord comes back to remind Abram that if one has the Lord, they got everything. Somebody say that with me. If I got God, I got everything. He said, another thing, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. A lot of folk praying for a house, but they ain't got Jesus. A lot of folk praying for a car, but they ain't got Jesus. People praying for a new job, new environment, but you ain't got Jesus. When you recognize if you get God, everything else is going to fall in line because it's a package deal. God said, if you would but seek my will, do what I have commanded you to do. You ain't got to worry about where the money coming from. You ain't got to worry about where the roof over your head coming from. You ain't got to worry about where your protection is coming from. If you seek my face and do my will, all these other things will be added unto you. What bird ever knocked on your door and asked you where the worms was coming from? What lily ever uprooted itself and came and knocked on your door and said, hey, do you have some substance for me? If God cares for the lilies of the field and the fowl of the air, how much more does he care for you? So, 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 what earthly possession do we have that can compare to God's love. That can compare to his grace. That can compare to his mercy and his forgiveness. When we have him, we got it all. We possess it all. Even if we have none of this world's goods, we can be earthly poor and still heavenly rich. The child of God is not to be pitied because we have it all as long as we have God. Now, Abram is concerned and he's burdened about all the promises that he has received. 
His are not questions of doubt, but they are honest questions. By, by the way, God doesn't mind questions. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember as a, a as a child, somebody told me one time, you don't you don't, you, don't, you don't ask God no question. You don't, you don't question God. But as I got older, I realized that the only way for me to acquire knowledge is for me to ask a question. If I expect to learn something, uh, it's not going to happen by me keeping my mouth closed. I'm going to have to ask God some kind of question. And, and, and everybody in here has been at a place in your life, whether it was the loss of a loved one or whether it was some kind of other situation that happened in your life where you just had to sit back and be like, God, oh, hey, what's going on? I don't understand. What are you doing right here? Well, you know, what, what, what's going on? And his questions are honest. He's asking God, hey God, you promised me. You said that in my seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You made me these promises, but I'm not seeing anything. Abram knew where to take his burden to. And as a result, he got the answers that he was looking for. There's a lesson in that for you and me this morning. God, and that is that because God's answer brought hope to Abram's heart once again. It brought hope to him. Now, now God's promise is stated in the simplest and the clearest terms. Abram is assured again that he will have a son and that that son will be his heir. Now, note this. All of God's promises are made in the same manner. He speaks very clearly in his word. Oh, that we will learn to just take God at his word and to just believe him. We got to get to a point where we don't just believe in God, but we believe God. And it's a difference in one believing in God and one believing God. Meaning that no matter what I'm facing, I believe God. No, no matter what I'm going through, I believe God. It, it doesn't look good, but I believe God. And I believe God because he said in his word that he would never put more on me than I am able to bear. I believe God. God's promise said something about God's power. Abram ain't no spring chicken. He ain't just... Over the hill, he is the hill. <laughs> Abram is an old man. Well past the days of anybody thinking about having a child. God's promise is designed to overcome the laws of nature. And to do what men and women say can never be done. Note this. It would do the people of the Lord well to simply understand that God is able. Simply, God is able. And we need to remember that he is a God who operates in the realm of all power. He doesn't just have some power. God has all power. And we need to remember that we do not serve a God of the can do. We serve a God of the has done. Before we ever exercise our little bit of faith, his plan is already in motion and he is working out his will through his power. Now, Abram was concerned about a single heir to his fortune. God was concerned with giving him more heirs than he would ever be able to count. God wanted Abram to know that he was about to receive a blessing so big that it was going to blow his mind. We serve a God of abundance on this morning. He wants to do more in our lives than we could ever imagine. If we could ever get a hold of that principle on today and just realize that we don't just serve a God that can do a little bit. We serve a God that can do exceeding and abundant above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. He's not interested in doing the ordinary run-of-the-mill thing. He wants to do, he says, exceeding and abundant above 
He wants to leave us scratching our head in amazement at how the Lord was able to do that. His, how, how was his power able to bring me through that? I just want to know, do I have at least two or three people in here that have been through some situations in your life? And, and, and now that you're on the other side of that situation, sometimes you find yourself there sitting up there just scratching your head. Some of y'all do it like this. You don't scratch, you do it like that. You know, you, know, you sit back and you just wonder, man, how did it happen? How did I get out? How did I get over? How did I make it through? How did I succeed? It was not you. It was all because of the power of God. So he's not interested in doing the, the little bit. He wants to blow our minds. He didn't blow my mind just this year. He has. He's blown my mind just this year alone. To know that I'm surrounded by sickness. And I'm still standing. To, to know that I'm surrounded by, by something that I can't even see that is taking the lives of people on a daily basis. But yet and still, I get up every morning. I put one foot in front of the other. I, 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 go, and I, and I go and come as I plead because of his grace and mercy towards me. I don't deserve it. Do you know that I and you were no better than the 214,000 that have died? You, we, you are no better, no better than any of those that lost their life. It's all because of grace and mercy. And when you think about it, for those to have gone and for us to have still been here, it lets us know God still got some work for you to do. He still got work for you to do. And, and, and you remember a couple chapters ago, when Abram um, lied about his wife and told them that she was his sister because he was fearing that the people were going to kill him if he told them that she was his wife. When well, what was he fearing and what was he afraid of when God had already made him a promise? When God had already told him what he was going to do? We have no reason to fear. We have no reason to doubt because God has already made us a promise. And I know we can go through some stuff in his life because anybody that's lived one or two days know that life will take you through that. Am, am I right about it? Life will take you through the ring or chew you up and spit you right back out. And a lot of times it'll leave you questioning and have you doubted. But as a child of God, when you are going through the fires of this life, when you are fighting the battles of this life, and we fight on a day-to-day -day basis, but we recognize that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the power and the spiritual wickedness that is set up in high places. We are in a battle every day of our life every day of our life that's why we got to be well equipped to be able to do battle with the devil when those days and times come against us now God is the God of more than enough not just the God of enough he's the God of more than enough and as I said again, he's not just interested in, in, in doing the bare minimum. He wants to exceed our expectations. Now, this is one of the simplest yet greatest verses in the Bible. And that's verse number six of our text. And it said that, and he, talking about Abram, yes, sir. Yes, sir. believed in the Lord. Yes, and he, God, counted it as righteousness I believe I'll read that again let me and he believed in the Lord and he counted it unto him as righteousness that tells us all about Abram's faith what it teaches us about his faith should be true about our own faith as well the little word in, I in, tells the tale. Abram has moved beyond hearing the word of the Lord and believing the promises of God into a place of casting himself totally in faith upon the Lord himself. He doesn't just believe the word anymore. He believes God. 
He is like Job in Job 13 and 15. His faith is in the Lord. Note this. Had your faith made that transition this morning? It's one thing to believe what the Bible says about God and his promises. And it's another thing altogether to move from acceptance of the facts to absolute trust in the person. One of those leads to everlasting life and the other leads to eternal damnation. Now, Abram believed in spite of the obstacles that he faced. No doubt there were others around him who said, man, you crazy. You've been drinking that bad honey wine. You didn't stay out of it. I don't know what you got going on. They thought he was a fool when he started talking about what the Lord had promised him. Any of y'all ever experienced that? When you ever sought out to do something for God, you ever said, man, I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to follow God's way. It's always somebody around, man, you ought to just give up on that Jesus stuff, man. You ought not. I don't know why you always going down to that church. I don't know why you always doing this, doing that. There will always be obstacles against the man or woman who seeks to live for God. When he started talking about what God had promised him, they tried to make him doubt, but what did he do? He believed in God. That's the challenge for me and you today. Our faith in him should be unwavering. It should be unsellable. Men may mock us because we believe that there's an afterlife, because we believe that there's a heaven. I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and the conversation was kind of funny to me. Um, he was like, preacher man, well, how, how do you really know? That there's a heaven. He was like, how, how do you really know? Like, have you been? You know, whatever. I was like, well, if I've been, you wouldn't see me. <laughs> he said, so, so, so how are you going to know that heaven and hell is real? I said, well, i tell you this. I'm going to keep on living the way I live. And when I get to heaven, I'll send you a postcard. And when you get the way you're going, just remember what I told you. <laughs> Abraham believed in spite of the obstacles that he went through. And if you are a child of God, don't let no trial that you go through shake you so bad that you stop believing in God. Don't, don't let no trouble that you go through in this life beat you down so bad that it leaves you questioning, is God still able? No, he's not just able, he is more than able to do what you need him to do. Now, faith in God always pays off big. It does. It pays off big. And Abram was no exception. When, God, when Abram believed God, God erased Abram's sin and applied his own perfect righteousness to Abram's account. God looked at Abram as being a just and righteous man. Salvation it has always been a work of faith. This lesson from Abram's life should be applied to our life. Abram was not saved by keeping the law because the law had not yet been given. So you can't say that he was saved by keeping the law because how was he saved by something that had not yet been revealed? He was not being saved by circumcision for circumcision had not yet been commanded. He was saved by simple Childlike faith in God. What a message that Abram believed God. A message about a son promise. And we say that faith is the what? Substance of things that we hope for. The evidence of things that we cannot see. He, he didn't see a child. And that's why he tried to intervene in the plan of God. We're going to get to that. We got Nick's. Well, we we going to see how he tried to intervene in the plan of God and try to say, hey, you know, God just acting a little bit too slow. God, you know what? You, you ain't acting as quick as I want you to act. Hey, hey, you over there. Come over here. Come on. I, I need you to help me out with something. I need, come on, leave, leave. Stop what you're doing. I need Sarah to get out of the room. Come on. I need you to help me out with something. Any of y'all in here ever tried to help God out? With his plan. Any of y'all ever tried to initiate, uh, not, not so much like Abram. Let's, let's, let's get back in the church right now. Let's, let's, you know, we, we ain't trying to be like Abram. 
But how many of us have ever prayed to God? Have ever prayed to God to help us out in a certain situation in our life? And then when we asked God to help us, we went out and tried to get help from all other sources, all kind of means, trying to get this person to do something about it. And that person, if you take it to God, that's the only person that you need to take it to. You remember um, when uh, Sennacherib, a man by the name of Sennacherib, wrote a letter to King Hezekiah. Um, and Ken Sennacherib was a bad, he was a bad member of He was a bad joke. He was going around destroying cities and killing people. And, and he wrote Hezekiah a letter and said, hey man, don't let your God fool you. In so many words, don't let your God fool you. I don't care. Don't let that God make you faint. That I'm not going to come in and take over your land, take over your possessions, what you got. Wrote him a letter, sent it by his messengers. Hezekiah looked at the letter, and the Bible says that he went into the house of God, spread it out before the altar of God. In other words, he said, God, this is your man. I, I can't do nothing with Sennacherib and the Assyrian army. And let me tell you, when situations like that come in your life, instead of you trying to fight, instead of you trying to battle, instead of you trying to do something with it, the best thing for you to do is to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. God, I can't handle it. I can't do anything about it. But I know if you get your hands on it, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Now, you'll probably live your whole life and never hear voices coming from a speck of dust. I hope not. I have to call somebody to come pick you up and evaluate you. At least I hope that's the case, that you'll never hear voices coming from a speck of dust. However, I want you to know this morning, God got a word for your life. He has a word for your life. Abram heard a word from the Lord. And he believed that word. And it forever changed his life. I wonder. Has the Lord given to some need in your life this morning? Is there some battle that you're fighting? That you need the Lord to bring peace in the situation? Is there anybody going through a storm this morning? And you just say, hey God, even if the rain don't stop falling, just let the thunder stop rolling. I, 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 even if the tide don't stop standing high, Lord, just, just let the lightning, just let the lightning stop flashing. It, anybody in some area in your life, you need God to move. You can take God at his word. He won't fail you. Believe in him. Stand on him. Because as long as you're standing on him, you're standing on a sure foundation. You're standing on a sure foundation. And let me tell you, the big bad wolf, he's going to come. He's going to huff. And he's going to puff. But he will not be able to do anything with the child of God that has set their foot on the word of God and they believe God. Let me tell you, that's what you call unwavering faith. That's what you call a faith that is unshakable because you know that before you ever get to the situation, you already realize that the child of God is going to face storms in his life. And you recognize that the same man that was with you pre-storm is going to be with you during the storm. Is also going to be with you post-storm. Is also going to be preparing you for the next storm that you are going through. Everything that you go through in this life, you don't go through it for no reason. God has a lesson in every test that you go through for you to learn. And just like it was when you were in school, in order for you to elevate to this level, you got to first pass what's on this level. So many of us trying to get to this and we can't even deal with that. For every level, there's a different devil. What do you, what do you mean, preacher? What you conquered yesterday wasn't nothing but a little Yorkie. Now you got a big Doberman standing at your door. 
Now you got something else that what you overcame prepared you for what was coming. So when I get into the next fight, when I find myself in the next battle, the same faith that I had to overcome that last thing, I got to have that faith and more now because now that I've overcome that, my faith ain't at the same level, but now my faith has increased. Because now I know that he's able. It was just like when the Queen of Sheba came to see King Solomon. She said, I had heard about you when I was still in my homeland. But behold, the hand had never been told. The hand had, hadn't even been told of what God is able to do. We don't serve a God of the bare minimum. We serve a God of more. We serve the God of more. And we serve the God of abundance. And I'm believing God for more in my life. I'm believing God for abundance in my life. And I know that's only going to happen when my faith is anchored in him. I, I, I cannot be a person that has faith as long as I'm receiving what I want. I can't, I can't be a person that has faith a, a, as long as things are lining up the way that I want them. I got to have faith when I don't understand. I got to have faith when I don't like what I'm going through. I got to have faith when I don't like necessarily what God is doing. I got to have faith and say, Lord, your thoughts are above my thoughts. Your ways are above my ways as high as the heavens are from the earth so far are your ways from my ways. God, before I was ever came into this world, you had a plan and a purpose for my life and I recognize that everything that I'm going through is preparing me. Joseph sitting down. Why I gotta be in prison? I, I mean, I, I didn't do nothing to my brothers. I was just my daddy's favorite. That wasn't my fault. They could have made their own coat. I got a coat, you know. Why did they have to sell me into slavery? Why? After I've interpreted the dream of my cellmates, they forgot about me. Why? Why am I having to go through all this? Because Joseph, you wouldn't appreciate the palace until you've been to prison. You, you wouldn't know how to operate in the capacity that I'm going to put you until you know what it's like to be down on your luck. And you wonder why you had to go through what you had to go through. You wonder. Lord, what? Lord, I just got over this. For real? For real? Like, is this what we're doing? God, I thought it was better than that. It's all for a reason. It's all for a purpose. You can say right now, if it wasn't for God taking you through some of the storms that you've been through in your life, you wouldn't even be up in here this morning. Because it is the trials of our life that draw us close to the God, that draw us nearer to God. Because we just got to be real, during the good times, we thank him, but we ain't really worried about it. It's not until the good times have ceased and the bad times begin to roll. That we find ourselves back down on bended knee. Asking God to help us just one more time. But God had to come back to Abram. Because Abram had been through some stuff. Since God had first made him the promise. And now Abram has been through storms. He's been through situations. And he's now just saying, God, what's up? You know, like, is the promise still going to happen? Are you still going to do what you said that you were going to do? Like, like, I have faith. My faith is not left. I just want to know. I'm just asking you a question. Are you still going to do what you promised me? I'm so glad that God is not like man, that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man, that he should repent. God ain't like us, where you got to go and fact check us. 
like 45. <clears throat> you, know, God, you know, God is not like us. What we have to worry about, is he going to do it? Is he going to hold up on his promise? God don't lie. He cannot lie. Why can't he lie? Because he is true. That's why he cannot lie. And if he said that he'll do it, God will do it. You hold on. You hold on. Just because you're not seeing the promise right now does not mean that it's not going to happen. It just may not be happening according to your timeline. I got plans about things that I want to do in my life. But just because it's not happening right now, I'm not going to get upset with God and mad at God. I just realized that God, first of all, has to take me where he has me right now. And after I've gotten through and conquered what I've conquered, what I'm dealing with right now, now he says, okay, now I know that you're ready. Now that I know that you're serious, now you are well equipped for where I'm going to take you. Abram had. Hello, I'm down Richard down Coffey, there. senior minister of Sweet. Abram had to fall out with life. He had to go through all of that stuff in order for God to get him to a place that he could do something with him. Are you at a place in your life? That God can work with you? Are you, at a, are you at a place in your life where you can say that you have fully and totally submitted yourself to the will of God? Are you at a place where you can truly say nothing else matters? It's all about God. He can do something with you when you're at that place. But as long as we have it in our minds that we're good. I'm all right. I'm doing pretty fair. I'm making it. As long as we're at that place, we are like a ship without a sail, tossed and driven on the weary seas without any sense of direction. But when we give ourselves fully over to God, God can use us. And I don't know about you, but I want to be used by God. I want to be used by God for his will and for his will. Lord, whatever you want me to do, Hear my Lord. Send me. Send me. If you're here this morning and you're not a, a child of God, you stand outside of the ark of safety. You have never had your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Time, I would have you to recognize, for each and every single one of us is quickly winding down. Preacher, how do you say that? Because we're closer to our life's end right now than we were when we woke up this morning. Every day that we live, we're getting closer and closer to that great getting up morning when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want y'all to know, you're not coming here for no reason. You're not serving God for no reason. You're, you're not having faith for no reason. You're doing all of this down here because you're just making preparation. For that great getting up morning. When the Bible says that all the dead in Christ are going to rise what? Earth. Earth. Well, what you mean? Dead in Christ going to rise first. Because he already said that when he comes back, he said judgment is going to begin first of all at the household of faith. So stop spending your time talking about those out in the world. Because judgment ain't going to begin with them. It's going to begin with us. He's going to come back and just like any of y'all ever watch your, your mama or your grandmama cook. And uh, sometimes when she would sift flour, she'd have that little, that little tin thing and she'd put the flour in there and she'd get to, you know, sift it. And, and uh, Sister Nichols said, you know, all the, the good flour will fall through. But if you had any bold weevil or any kind of bugs or something like that, you know, it'll stay on top. So all the good stuff will fall through. And that's why he said in his word, let the wheat and the tap grow up together. Don't you try to separate nobody. When I come back, I'll do the separate. When God come back, he's going to separate the real from the fake, the sheep from the goat, the saint from the ain't. Which side you going to be on? He's going to know those that are his. He coming back, he said, for a church without spot or wrinkle. Without blemish and without spot. We got to make ready, y'all. And I learned, and I was always told something, that if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. If you stay prepared, I 
keep a fishing reel in my trunk. And now that there's a dancer that turned me on to golf, I keep a, my golf set in my trunk. Because I want to be always ready. Might see a good hole on the side of the road, have to get out there, you know, and, and see what's going on. I want to be always ready. So if we want to be always ready to do battle with the devil, we got to be equipped. You got to be ready. He's not taking a break. Just because COVID came, he didn't go into hiding and say, you know what, I'm going to chill out till things get better. He's still been on his job. So just like he was on his job, we got to be on ours. I, I know some, some people may have found it hard to be on their job because you know, I, 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 I got to have somebody to teach me. I got to have somebody to talk to me. But I want to encourage every believer to get to a place in your life where you don't need nobody to coach you. You don't need nobody around to prompt you. But you can get in the word of God all by yourself. You can have trip riding down the road in your own car. You can have serving all by yourself. Let the church say amen. Look at your seat. Let's say amen. Seat. Amen. A -a amen. Lord. Thank God. Thank God. He's been good. You testify of the goodness of God because of what he has done in your life. So if you're here this morning, you're not a child of God. You stand outside of the ark of safety. Why not make the best decision you could ever make? And that is to make Jesus your choice. Jesus is not the best choice. He's the only choice for anybody that's seeking to have eternal life. Before the foundation of the world, he had a plan. We know within his mind. He had a plan within his mind because God is not like us that just knows about what's going on right now. Our God has the power to look over into time and to see issues and problems that are going to arise. God already knew, because we, ever since he made us, we just been messing up. He told us, hey, you can eat from the palm, the plum tree, you can eat from the apple tree, you can eat from the orange tree, you can eat the bananas, you can eat the grapefruit, you can even eat the grapes. Just don't eat that tree over there in the midst of the garden. We had all this other stuff, and yet and still we had to go over there and eat off of the tree that he told us not to eat off of, because as human beings, like the group, we just naughty by nature. Ooh, that's going to have to be a sermon later on right there. <laughs> Naughty by nature, we got a sin problem. And we have had a sin problem since we were made. Because Satan knows he was there when you were made. He knows that we were created to glorify God and to do his will. So since the beginning of time, he's been doing any and everything that he could do. To get us off of the path of God. God said don't eat of the tree. Because in the day of you eat of it. You shall surely die. He come put one word in there. And Eve just lost her mind. But he said I shall not surely die. She ate of it. And we know. As a result of what they did. Humanity is in the position that it is today. Because of the decision that they made. So man has always had a problem with sin. God knew that man was going to get to a point. That he was going to get so far that he was going to need redemption. He was going to need salvation. All throughout the Old Testament, we're reading and we see all kinds of theophanies. What is a theophany? Well, where Jesus Christ just decides to come and show up and make himself manifest. Who do you think Jacob was wrestling with? He comes and he shows up and just makes himself personal. Jesus just didn't show up on the scene when Mary birthed him. He was there in the creation. Because God looked at him and said, let us make man in our own image. John, let us know in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and came down and dwelt among us, and we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came that we might have life, he says, and that we might have that life more 
abundantly. He didn't say it somewhere that my prayer for you is that you would prosper and be in good health. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer. So he has a plan for us today. His plan is still the same as it was in the scripture. God's word has not changed. Times change. Seasons change. We change. But God does not change. His word does not change. It's the same yesterday. The same today. It'll be the same even forevermore. The same way they were saved on the day of Pentecost. When the church had its first ever gospel explosion. They had their first ever gospel meet. Had their first ever revival. They got up there and Peter began to preach to them. And told them that that same Jesus they had crucified. Was coming back to judge the world. After he got through preaching. They looked on Peter and the rest of the apostles. And said men and brothers. You have said all this, now what I got to do? He said, repent. Ain't that simple? He didn't tell me I had to come up here. He didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't tell me I had to come up here and call on Jesus until I get filled with the Holy Ghost. He didn't tell me I had to come up here and pray at the mourner's bench. Until the power would come down. He didn't tell me that I had to come and stand uh, before a, a group of dignitaries or a board of people. And they vote on whether or not I become a candidate for salvation. That's why I'm so glad that none of y'all ain't got nothing to do with my salvation. I'm so glad that ain't no other man or woman got nothing to do with my salvation. Because if they did... Just imagine if your enemy could affect your salvation. Hell would be full. And heaven would be empty. So, so, he came that we might have life. Came that we might have that life more abundantly. And he tells us that if we want to be saved, if we want to be added to his body, the simple plan is to repent. And be baptized. To repent means I'm walking this way. I've heard the correct way. Now I've turned around. And I'm going the way that God would have for me to go. Now, now the only way my direction is going to change is if my mind changes. Because if there's no change in my mind, I'm still going the right way. I'm still doing what I'm supposed to do. God is still pleased. But once there's a change within the mind, it produces a change in the action. And now you got something on the inside, working on the outside, bringing about a change in your life. So he says repent and be baptized. To be baptized means to be immersed. It means to be buried. You remember with Philip and the eunuch, it said that they both went down into the water. And then they came up. I, I don't know nobody that just put their foot in the bath and bathed their foot. And don't bathe the rest of their body. I don't know nobody that just get, get up, wash their head and wash their face. And don't wash none of the rest of the body. Because even though the head may be clean, the body going to carry over. And all of us know, and enough cologne and perfume in the world to cover up funk, you know. <laughs> and uh, ain't enough in the world to cover it up. So, so we must be buried. We must be immersed. A little dab won't do. A, a little bit just won't do. We cannot do it according to what we like. What pleases us. I'll give you a great example in closing. My great grandmother was not baptized until she was 84 years old. Can't walk, barely, you know, anything like that. And when she was first baptized, she was sprinkled back in the 40s or whatever. She was sprinkled, and that's how they did it. And, uh, uh, she, you know, she could have said, you know, well, I'm old and you know, I don't want to be getting up there in that thing and y'all having to, you know, dip me down and all that kind of stuff. But she understood, according to God's word, 
that it was necessary for her to be buried with Christ. And the scripture lets us know that just as Christ was lowered into earth, when we are lowered down, we die to ourselves while we are in the water. And it lets us know that we rise up as new creatures walking in a newness of life. So come by hearing this word. Believe in that saying. Repenting of your sins. Confessing Christ as your savior. Being buried with him in the watery grave of baptism. Have your sins washed away, done away with, never to come up before you in this life, neither the life that is to come. And according to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, the Lord himself will add you to his body. And after that, now it is your job to remain faithful unto death. And he said that if you remain faithful until death, you'll receive a crown of life that will never that will never fade away. And if you are here today, you're already a Christian, but you're just saying, hey man, I need some prayer. That's all of us this morning, I believe. That, that's all of us. I believe we're all standing in the need of prayer. So if you're here this morning and you're subject to the invitation, we beg and we plead. Why not? Come to Jesus now. And together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Careless soul, why will